I'm speaking with composer uh, Nathan Barr, who has done a slew of uh, popular scores, including his uh, hits Hostel, Hostel 2, and Cabin Fever. This year, Nate is up for two Emmy nominations for his themes to The Americans and Hemlock Grove. And of course, he has been composing the hit series uh, True Blood, which just announced that its upcoming season will be uh, the final one. Uh, thanks so much for uh, chatting today. Absolutely. Happy to, happy to talk about all of it. <laughs> so uh, since this is our, our first time uh, talking, I would love to know how you got into film scoring. You know, When did you become aware of film and TV scores, and what about it made you follow it as a career path? Sure. Um, I had parents who were both musical. My dad uh, sang and played banjo and guitar, and my mom uh, played piano. And when we lived in Japan when I was younger, she played an instrument called kodo as well. So I sort of grew up around musical parents in a home with sort of a lot of different uh, unusual instruments floating around the house. So that kind of whet my appetite from an early age for many different kinds of music and collecting instruments and all that stuff, which is something I've continued to do to, to this day. And um, I just always loved movies uh, ever since I was a kid, and I had always paid attention to music and movies in particular. Um, they, they were just such a part of the film-going experience for me, the music was. And so um, I really always thought it would be fun to be a film composer, whatever that meant at that time in my life. <laughs> and um, I got sort of lucky when I came to Los Angeles in 1996. Um, I was working in a production company, and uh, someone at that company one day sort of pulled me aside and said, hey, there's a job listing here for a prominent Hollywood film composer seeking driver slash assistant. And uh, it turned out to be Hans Zimmer, and I, I was down to me and two other candidates, and we each met with Hans, and Hans kind of, I guess, vibed with me best, so he hired me, and that was that was my sort of entree into film music. And um, I got a really big crash course in sort of what the life of a top film composer looked like in terms of working style and um, lifestyle, the pressures, the excitement, all that stuff. And so that was sort of my really lucky um, break into it. And I was I was with Hans only about eight months, and I got an agent and then went off on my own and uh, and started working. And um, it's just, it's something I love. I, I love music by itself. I love films by themselves. But together, the two things are just an unbelievably magical combination. And I think, um, you know, some of my happiest creative moments in life are when I'm working on a good project and a piece of music I've just written takes the visual impact of a moment up to a whole other level because of what I've done and that that's really exciting I mean I agree with that's that's why I love it too because I love them both separately but when you marry image and sound it's just something amazing happens there <laughs> absolutely absolutely and uh so now I must congratulate you on your double Emmy nominations how excited were you uh, when you heard the news I was thrilled. I was thrilled. I, I was sort of sort of keeping an eye on it each each year ever since I've been on True Blood because honestly that was the first that was my real first TV show I'd ever done. Right. Um, uh, and so it became a possibility with a show with that kind of uh, audience, and um, that that never happened. So I was I was really surprised um, to receive not only one but two nominations for two shows that I had just started on in season one and. And um, that was really exciting because they were they were main titles that um, I mean I, I have a lot of friends who are composers and and getting a main title written and approved is was an absolute um, you know challenge for them rightfully so because oftentimes there are going to be so many people calling shots on on the creative team and I got to say these two uh, I, I happen to come across preliminary ideas for the main titles for both these shows very quickly. And there were quite a few versions around sort of like how to end each of the pieces or when to bring a certain element in. Mm -hmm. But the actual overall process of getting to the to the finished product was not nearly the struggle that I've, I know other people have had. And, and that's partly a credit to, I guess, just the, the people that I'm working with are, are really open to, uh, to uh, letting me bring to the table what I, what I bring. So, yeah, you, you were nominated for your title theme. So, in your opinion, what makes a good TV series theme? What is the goal, I guess, musically for a theme of a well, show? Yeah, I think, you know, someone, I don't remember who said it, but someone else said, you know, a good main title theme is a theme that you hear from the other room while you're getting popcorn in the kitchen that makes you want to rush back into the <laughs> TV. So, so I think, I think it's like, 
Um, you know, the main title for the Americans is only 25 seconds. The main title for Hemlock Grove is only 55 seconds. So I think it's really saying um, as much as you can about the mood and atmosphere of the show in the briefest amount of time that sort of um, gives the show a very specific, unique signature that everyone recognizes um, from hearing it right away that this is the show starting. And so I think um, that can be thematic, <clears throat> and I think it can also be uh, a matter of arrangement and orchestration, um, tempo. I think all those things become really, really important because it's such a brief spurt of music, um, for such a brief amount of time that you're given to figure it out. So right. 25 seconds, the Americans, I got to sort of introduce the show, tell people what it's about, what they might be experiencing during the body of the show, and then you blink and it's done. So... <laughs> so- when you when when you're working on that, like there's a lot of shows kind of have a little kind of a montage of scenes or kind of a artistic uh, opening title sequence. Is that does that edited to your music? Because it, like a show for some like something like Lost, where the main titles are boom, you know, like five seconds long. Yep. So where does the yep. concept of like do you come up with the the time length first and like this is a perfect time length or do the creators kind of do you talk with them about how long the the piece of music should be? Yeah, I think I think in my experience at least, um, it's been we have X amount of time, go for it. And um, I think with Hemlock Grove, um, those beautiful sort of colorful smoke wisps were mm. created. Um, and those are beautiful. And this certainly served directly as an inspiration to me to sort of figuring out what the sound of the thing was going to be. And with the Americans too, it was just, it's just sort of this assault of images uh, from the United States and Russia. And um, very, very quick. You know, it's 20, 25 seconds again. Yeah. So, yeah, so usually, yeah, they give me the time and then I've got to work with them that. But having said that, once the music is sort of getting close, they might start to, you know, uh, change the edit slightly here or there to, to match up better to the music. Oh, cool. Um, so now uh, season seven of True Blood will be the last one. It's coming to an end after all these years. Uh, what has it been like working on that show for this long? And finally having an end point in sight. It's really, it, it has been such an amazing run. So while it's really sad to have it over, I, I got, I have nothing sort of, but gratitude for the whole experience. It, it was really one of those perfect experiences that everyone hopes for, that we all hope for. Um, I mean, the, everyone involved knew that what they were involved in was special that, um, you know, we'll all be lucky to get another show like this anytime soon. And so I think um, creatively, it was just such a, Alan Ball, the, the show's creator, created such a fertile ground for everyone. And he, he truly is a, an amazing person to work with. And, and that trickles down to every level of the production. Mm -hmm. So I think you'd be hard pressed to find a single person on True Blood who, who had some sort of negative experience. So <laughs> on that level, it's really sad to see the show coming to an end. But but again, it's been such an enormous success. I mean, seven seasons is is amazing, especially yeah. for a show the size and scope of True Blood. So, and you know, it is it is an HBO series, and they are known for bigger scopes and kind of bigger production values. But also, their seasons, you know, are shorter than say broadcast. Um, so, when you start on a season of True Blood, do you know where the season is going? Do the writers give you like a sketch outline, or do you just kind of take one episode at a time? I I like to enjoy the show as a fan, mm -hmm. um, so I have access to as far ahead into the future as they've got when I start on the first episode of each season. But I don't I I don't really like to read any of the shows that I'm on because I love to just I love for the spotting session to be my first time seeing the show because if I'm sitting down and experiencing the show as a fan for the first time, it allows me to react um, in a way that that helps me sort of compose because I'm bringing my own excitement about where the show's going directly into the work I'm doing as far as the music goes. Uh -huh. um, and because I have no idea where the show is going, um, I have no expectations. Um, it, it really keeps me surprised. And if I, if I read a script, then I have expectations immediately for how she, it seems to be shot or acted or anything like that. And I think um, just keeping everything as spontaneous as possible um, is the best way to go. That's a good. That's a good method. I think uh, I remember hearing Michael Giacchino say something about Lost, and that's how he does it. He wants it to be his initial emotional reaction. So that's really cool. Absolutely, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, so you also perform a lot of the instruments on your scores. Is there a creative uh, reasoning behind that, or you just love performing? 
I think it's both. I think it's a bit of both. I mean, I, I think um, I, I discovered very quickly when I first started writing, trying to write music for TV and movies that um, if I was writing a guitar part, I found it really hard to think like a guitarist mm-hmm. if I was writing on the keyboard. And so just, I, I think, um, I think, as I think musicians, we as musicians, we all get locked into certain physical, actual physical patterns. Like on a guitar, we play a certain way. On a piano, we play a certain way. And so I think um, keeping it fresh across many different instruments keeps the whole process of improvising and composing, for me at least, surprising. Like I, I don't think I would ever write a chord progression the same on a guitar as I would on the piano. Um, and so even writing orchestral parts first on a guitar makes me, I guess, approach harmony and melody in a way completely differently than I, than I would approach it if I were on the piano. Hmm. So that's certainly one of the reasons. And the other reason is I just love, it keeps the experience of actually sitting day after day, hour and hour after hour in front of these shows. It keeps them very interesting if, if I get to pick up different instruments and explore different sounds, um, very organically, um, throughout, throughout each day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it comes through, and I think it comes through in your music as well. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so now Hemlock Grove uh, was a Netflix production, and you, there's another. You have a fellow Emmy nominee, Jeff Beale, uh, also nominated for his yes. theme for House of Cards, a Netflix production. Yes. Uh, what do you think of this whole Netflix model of shows? Do you think television will shift more towards this model in the future? Do you think that uh, broadcast is going to kind of go towards give all the fans all the episodes at once? I don't know. I mean, I can only speak for myself, and I can give you an example, like with the show Dexter, which I love. I I don't have Showtime, um, and even even if I did, I love the the at least having the ability to watch through two, three, four episodes at a time. Because if a show's really good, it it just makes that week in between the next episode just so impossible. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I don't know. At least for me, it makes a lot of sense to to have everything released at once. House of Cards, for example, which I absolutely loved. You know, I watched it in two or three days, the whole, the whole series, and it would have been really, um, a really different experience to me if, if I had to wait week to week to, to keep watching it. So I, I really love this this model. Does it uh, does it change your production or your production schedule at all? Is it uh, easier to work with? Um, it, you know, what, the only it's actually the only complication I've run into um, the the studio studios, and I think to some extent, rightfully so are more aware of the fact that people are going to be, quote, binge-watching, and mm-hmm. because of that, they're more, more, um, they're more sensitive to the repetition of themes. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. And I think, I think part of that is okay, and I think part of it is, is maybe not, not quite guided in the right direction. But um, I, think, cause I, think, I think the themes and the sound of it, the music unifies the show, right? Whether people are watching it week after week or one against the other, mm-hmm. I think it's, it's a big part of the identity of the show. So I think it remains to be seen. Um, uh, I know that was one of the things I ran into, was just they were very sensitive about not overusing themes. Um, and I, I'm not sure that that's, that should be more of an issue for people if they're watching two or three in a row. Yeah, I mean, I, I know some people who, when they binge watch, they'll usually fast forward through the, the opening titles because, they go, okay, you yep. know, we've seen them over and over and over again, but I'm one of those people who just love that presentation. I just, I'll, I want to watch yep. the opening sequence and hear that music yeah, kind of yeah, lead yeah. to it. So. Totally. Totally, yeah, it kind of sets the stage for that, for that. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but to, uh, to wrap things up, I always love to ask composers uh, this one question. If you could score any film ever made with no disrespect to the original composer or the score... Which film would you choose? Um, I would probably choose. I would probably choose Captain's Courageous, which is a film direct uh, directed by Victor Fleming back in I think it's 1936. Yeah, that's Freddie and Spencer Tracy. Wow. I uh, it's Franz Waxman. And I absolutely love his score, so I, I wouldn't wouldn't want to try and outdo his score. But the scope of that film and the story uh, is just so absolutely beautiful, and it's an, a big ocean, epic sort of ocean, ocean-going movie. Mm-hmm. So that that would be one I would love to to revisit. Oh, that's an excellent answer. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, uh, Nathan, thanks so much uh, for your time and, and talking with me today. It's, uh, it was a great pleasure and honor to to chat with you. Thank you so much for the. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thanks for the call. Yeah.